Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Dr. Georgia Lindsay, Senior Lecturer in Architecture Design at the University of Tasmania. I want to begin by acknowledging the deep history and culture of this island. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people of the land upon which this campus of the University of Tasmania was built. I pay my respects um, to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status and to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. Um, so today, I am delighted to host the third of three panels celebrating the publishing of Contemporary Museum Architecture and Design Theory and Practice of Place. And today, four of the authors who contributed chapters will overview their work and take questions. And if you're interested in um, previous panels, the, the previous panel, um, I'm putting a link in the chat box if you would like to um, watch the previous panel. So this edited collection sprang from work that I was doing on a previous book that I wrote. Right after I finished my PhD, I wrote a book about the user perspective on contemporary art museum architecture using 14 case studies to identify seven user types. As I interviewed architects and museum administrators about museum buildings that they had designed, proposed, worked in, um, and, and inhabited, I realized that there was so much practical wisdom in the people who were designing and inhabiting these spaces. Designers and museum administrators, architects, um, are thinking about museum buildings in much broader terms and as serving much broader audience than I had sort of, than I see often in a lot of the museum scholarship that I was doing. So I wanted to create a venue for these ideas that I was listening in my, listening to in my interviews and seeing in the museum buildings. I wanted to create a venue for these ideas to be shared more broadly, a way to bring architects together and museum administrators together in conversation. So their work in different places could be, you know, talking to each other. And then today in um, this panel, they get to literally talk to each other. So the four experts um, here be present today uh, present new openings, new ideas for how museums can serve more people and how architecture and design can move with that. You can read their chapters along with 16 others at hopefully the local library if, you're, if your library has it, or if you want to own the book, I've put a, 20, I've put a link. Um, actually, let me put the link to it. And if you, if you get a, if you put in the code, um, you get a 20% discount with this. So I will introduce each speaker and they will present. And if there are any quick questions, you, you can answer those and you'll answer those immediately, but there will be a much longer block of time for questions and answers after all four of them have presented. Um, for attendees, if you have any questions for the panelists, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, um, or you can also put it in the chat box. And that the chat box goes to everyone so everyone will see it. Um, and I will monitor both of those and try to manage it. Um, but let's get started. Meredith Benassiak is Director of Research for Boulder Associate Architects, a healthcare design firm, and is a fellow with the Center for Conscious Design. Her research explores the intersection of cognitive science and architecture to maximize, to optimize well-being, access, and performance. And we put a little bit more to the link. All right, the hardest part, how do I share my screen? <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Georgia. This is my first time presenting in Australia, and even if it's virtually, it's really wonderful. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'll be speaking about sensory design, and this is a topic that's close to me because growing up, I struggled in many places um, because of the sensory experience. So in cities, for example, I found the combination of really intense and conflicting stimuli to be just overwhelming and stressful. Um, and so maybe you've um, experienced something similar if you've ever been to say a youth band practice or in this case this is the experience gallery at the musical instrument museum in scottsdale arizona
Arizona, um, where you have a situation, you have multiple instruments all playing at once and none of them playing in a very musical way. Um, and so the sensory information, in this case, all the sounds you're hearing is really just creating noise. And if you remain in this setting for a while, like the museum volunteer who I spoke with, um, it may actually cause physiological stress and she reported having headaches. Now, certainly noise is encouraged in this setting. We wanna engage kids and allow them to explore different sounds. Um, but in many settings, this kind of discordant sensory stimuli has unintended negative outcomes on users and is a result of the building design. So what can we do about it? Well, all buildings must address this relationship between user and context. And as designers, we wanna ensure that that sensory information coming from the context or the building um, across all the senses, it will layer in such a way as to create a coherent experience. With museums, we must also consider that relationship between user and contents or um, the exhibit material. We want to make sure there's enough salient sensory information for the user to perceive exhibits. And this is why museum design is, is extra challenging. There's more sensory complexity to choreograph. You've got user in context, user in contents, and you have that cumulative interaction effect of both context and content. How does the sensory information between the building and the exhibit interact? Is it creating a coherent sense of place or is it creating noise? And this is important not just for promoting enhanced sense making, but also for creating museum experiences which are inclusive and accessible to visitors across all sensory abilities. Fundamentally, it's a universal design issue. Good sensory design provides perceptible information. And this need for sensory design was really brought to light in 2004 when a complaint was filed against the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC for being inaccessible to those with visual impairments. The majority of their content was designed for sighted people. Ultimately, the US Department of Justice required the museum to make significant changes to their building um, and to their facility and exhibit material to ensure access and prohibit um, discrimination on the basis of sensory disability. And I think that case really prompted many American museums to move away from exhibits which were exclusively visual to ones that provided multi-sensory experiences. These um, multi-sensory updates that museums were making happened across both informational design, meaning um, museums started providing informational materials across formats like audio content and braille and large print and in different languages, um, as well as the artifacts, the artifactual design itself. So artifactually, the exhibits started to include sensory material, things were tactile, um, made, uh, made sounds, um, and these supplemented and enhanced the visual content or even could stand alone. I think a great example of advancing advancing sensory exhibit design, both artifactually and informationally, is Cooper Hewitt's The Senses Designed Beyond Vision. Um, and pictured here, this is a work where visitors experience sensations such as a bag of microwave popcorn um, it, through tactile vibrations and audio content. So you had a case where the multi-sensory content was embedded within the art and the exhibit provided information about the work in braille and text and audio formats. Another work from that same, um, from that same exhibit um, was Snowstorm. And here visitors could interact with falling snow by touching and smelling these suspended balls of felted wool that were infused with a winter inspired scent. Intentionally embedding buildings and exhibits and even objects with this kind of congruent or redundant sensory information, meaning the information we're getting visually um, um, parallels the information we're getting through touch or what we're hearing, for example, that's going to result in increased perceptibility. And using um, Upali Nanda's synthetics model, we can illustrate what's happening in the brain. You see that multiple no sense nodes are firing 
and there's established neuron connections between those senses. So that means there's already, those connections are already firm, they're already made, and it's something that's familiar. It's a memory that's being replayed where we can understand the, and so we can better understand the idea um, communicated us through this compounded sensory information. The other hand would be when we have disparate or conflicting sensory information. And this is what was happening when I described my experience of being a child in the city. My brain was trying to interpret these unfamiliar combinations of stimuli. You still had all the senses being activated um, but uh, or multiple senses being activated, but the type of sensory information was different coming in, and um, there wasn't an existing connection um, in in the brain. And, and and even worse, kind of sensory information from one sense might have been in conflict with what another sense was trying to tell me. So my brain was really struggling to make meaning in that in that setting. How might um, sensory conflict be experienced in a museum setting? So this is something that Daniel Liebskin's Hamilton Building at the Denver Art Museum um, struggled with after opening in 2006. So at this time, you had emerging technology that was just making it possible to construct these new kinds of angled building forms, um, which were previously just um, kind of unaffordable or just technically hard to execute. And these new forms resulted in new, um, perceptual experiences for users and, and had some um, unanticipated results where the sensory information was misaligned. This particularly happens on the main staircase where the walls and the ceiling converge and diverge at all these angles. Um, and, and of course the floor plane in providing the intended vertical cir circulation is angled. And, and it's here that some users have reported feeling um, a sense of dizziness in response to the geometries. Now, the likely source of dizziness in a user's brain is, 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 is the user's brain struggling to orient itself in space. And our sense of orientation comes from multiple sensory information, which our brain tries to integrate and then adjust our posture or our movement so we can remain um, in the de desired position. One of those sources of input comes from vestibular structures in our inner ear that I was trying to show with these kind of toothbrushes here, where you have like this layer of kind of almost like gravel and it's pushing down on this dense bed of sensory cells um, in response to gravity. Gravity is kind of pushing it down and it signals to us whether our head is upright or tilted. Now, if I'm standing on the stairs, the message from my inner, inner, my inner ear cells is that I'm upright. Our visual system also contributes information about our body position. So you have disorienting visual cues signaling that my body is not upright. And this sensory conflict is causing confusion, the brain struggling to make sense of these competing messages, adjust my body, can position and, and that's what results in that dizziness sensation for some people. That sensory misalignment is not only contributing to um, kind of sensory discomfort, but also to potential um, mobility concerns and fall risks for users who might miscalculate their movements in response to that conflicting sensory information. Neuroscience studies also suggest that, the, that sharply angled build, building geometries can trigger a fear response because like other sharp objects, they may signal threat. So if a building is predisposing a visitor to dizziness and disorientation and fear and stress, you know, is it also kind of emotionally biasing um, what our experience might be of, of an artwork or a, a content in the, in the museum? What I think that the Denver Art Museum has done really well is begin to tune this interaction effect so there's not a disconnect between building and art. 
um, by including material that aligns with and is supported by the building itself. And I know, Georgia, you've written a lot about this in your publications that this kind of novel architectural form really inspired new art created for the building for which it becomes the ideal resonator. And you see this with the, the wall mural in this gallery next to the stairs I shared with you where the sharpness of the symbolic knife parallels the sensory experience introduced by those angled geometries in a very literal way. So let's look at another example. This is the third floor at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, designed by James Ingo Fried. And you'll notice it parallels the spatial vocabulary of the Hamilton building, but it creates a very different sensory experience because of its relationship to the content or the exhibit material. This museum directs visitors through three floors of, of densely packed, emotionally charged material that details the history of the Holocaust. And after finishing exhibits on one floor and before this, um, beginning the content on the next floor, visitors are brought into a lounge or a transition space such as is pictured here. Um, so you'll have to imagine that this lounge is, is a very stark counterbalance to that dense, um, sensory dense exhibit space with, with thousands of original objects from the Holocaust. As such, it offers a sensory and emotional reprieve by kind of limiting our arousal um, at key intervals along this overall journey. Because it's absent of attention grabbing stimuli, the spaces can optimize internal contemplation and actually support memory creation. And for memorial museums in particular, which this one is, supporting memory is a key goal. So Fried's intent to create what he calls a resonator of memory is very much realized with credit to his thoughtful inclusion of these pause spaces. Um, and for more on kind of the neuroscience um, um, basis for these pause spaces, you can um, refer to the um, citation by Miriam Hoffman there. So while these two examples are superficially similar, I think they demonstrate in different ways how sensory choreography can impact a museum visitor's experience and their relationship with the exhibit content. So in the Holocaust Museum, that lounge space provides a sensory reprieve supporting memory consolidation during key transition points along a sensory demanding journey. And in the Hamilton building, the building context has really become an opportunity to inspire new art forms and even provoke new perceptual experiences um, driven by the building geometries. However, that disorienting stare does set up a, a dangerous sensory um, conflict that can potentially increase fall risks. And I think that drives home our ethical obligation to reduce sensory conflict and support diverse sensory abilities in design so that the museum can remain an accessible place for all. That's it. Thank you. Um, I see we, we don't have any quick questions, so we're going to move right along. So Megan, Lakens Rich is interim Dir executive director for the Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA, Cleveland, where she has worked since 2004. Prior to this role, she supervised the museum's education, engagement, and interpretation, co-authoring the museum's current strategic plan and managing museum partnerships and crafting departmental projects. Curatorially, Rich has organized over 30 exhibitions for MOCA, and she has written, edited, or contributed to 13 catalogs and publications. Thanks. Can you see uh, my proper screen? Great. Uh, thanks to yes. Georgia for the invitation to speak and to contribute to this, um, this book uh, and to the previous book. Uh, it's been a joy to get to know you. And uh, this is also my first time speaking in Australia. So, uh, and I and I love speaking on the heels of Meredith's incredible uh, presentation because there's so many things that relate to what I'm going to talk about, which is a case study of the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland, where I've worked for 14 years and now serve as the interim executive director. Just to uh, position the institution for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, MOCA is a 52-year-old 
mid-size American museum based in Cleveland, Ohio, um, centered on contemporary art and culture. We serve approximately 45,000 non-virtual visitors. I say that now because in this realm, we actually are counting our virtual visitors in ways we've never done before. Uh, we do not have a permanent collection. So uh, our exhibitions rotate. Um, most are curated our, by our team of curators. We do take some traveling shows. We also have active social, educational, and engagement programming, working with a diverse set of audiences and community members. Our operating budget hovers around $3 million. Um, so that was that we sort of have a peer group in the United States of 20 to 30 or so museums with similar, similar characteristics. Um, over our lifespan, we've uh, occupied a number of spaces in Cleveland, um, and you see here some images of those spaces. Um, we began a new building project um, for our permanent home in about 2005. And uh, it was a move that we had wanted to do for some time. That first space you see in the upper left, uh, we originally were called the New Gallery, was a small storefront um, right along a main artery called Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, Ohio. And in University Circle, which is where most of the museums in Cleveland um, are, right on Case Western Reserve's campus. We wanted to get back to that site. Our site between 1990 and 2012 was nearby, but a little bit farther aflung and wanted to be in a more um, walkable, pedestrian friendly location um, to some of our um, you know, peers. So um, in 2005, we began that architectural project. And in 2012, we opened this um, iconic, outstanding museum building that you see here uh, pictured. It was designed by Farshid Musavi. Um, and it opened, as I mentioned, in 2012. Um, it sits between two roads, um, Euclid Avenue and Mayfield Road. These are also two main arteries. Um, it is an eight-sided building, obviously with a strange geometry, and we'll talk a little bit about the sensory issues with that that Meredith brings up in her presentation. Um, it's a modestly scaled building, 34,000 square feet, four floors. Um, and uh, each facet of those eight facets, uh, there are six triangles and two parallelograms that allow for a base that's hexagonal uh, that terminates in a square at the top. And the top floor is where our main gallery spaces are. Uh, and then we have other galleries uh, lower down as well. I'll show you a few images. This is a shot of the building from the main entrance, which um, actually does not face the intersection. Uh, Farshid positioned the building very close to the streets uh, and then as you can see um, created an interesting surface treatment which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we are located as I mentioned in University Circle and this map is a little bit hard to see but you can see the main relationships. Um, Case Western Reserve sort of surrounds us. Cleveland Institute of Art is, a, is an art school that is in the same block as us and then the Cleveland Museum of Art along with many other museums is about two blocks away. This is an aerial shot of the building that gives you again, the sense of faceting. Um, the building uh, is, is covered with a black stainless steel called Rymex, which is uh, was installed in a kind of rumpling way so that the reflection of the Rymex creates a sort of circus mirror effect. Um, nothing is really one-to-one -one and it creates a kind of uh, water front, like top of the water uh, surface that reflects the sky or the ground. So at any given time, the building looks very different. This is another view from the intersection that shows you what I mean. This is a gray, stormy day. The building really takes on the nature of the environment around it, as well as captures the cars, the pedestrians. Um, when we were designing the building, we wanted to create something that was um, inviting to the community in such that the ground floor could become what we were coining, what our former executive director coined, uh, an urban living room. So a space where students, community members, um, visitors could come, um, relax, get a bite to eat, shop, uh, check their email, maybe work on their computer, uh, see some art and then decide to go upstairs. Um, this is an image of the building um, sort of taken apart. I'm just gonna run through a few images that give you a sense of the architecture of the building. The uh, outside sits like a tent on top of this sort of traditional post and lentil uh, system. Uh, this is a bisected view where you get a sense of the space and the ground floor, as you can see, has a double high multi-purpose room uh, where we conduct a lot of our events and a monumental staircase that brings audience members up and then also down uh, through the building. This is a side view of the staircase 
which is really a monumental architectural feat of the building, uh, there is a fire stair embedded within the monumental stair. Uh, so there's a sort of MC Escher um, labyrinth stair happening within the exterior stair. So the exterior stair is, um, has many platforms. Uh, the uh, surface that surrounds it is a thin sheet of metal uh, that is painted white. So it feels very social. There's a lot of places to pause. The interior I'll show you a shot of is very different experience. Um, I just want to note that as a contemporary art museum, we seek opportunities at all, at all moments to engage contemporary artists. And this was actually an installation by a photographer locally named Barry Underwood um, that we did throughout the building of the building. Um, so you can see here how the structure came into to, to its own. This is an interior shot of the ground floor, and this is really what I'm going to focus on. Uh, as I mentioned, the ground floor was designed, it's a hexagon, it's a rather large space, as a space of invitation and gathering. It was the free space at the time that we opened the museum. We were a museum that had an admission fee. Uh, in March of 2019, we went free for all, but until that time, uh, there was an admission fee, so the idea was that you could enter the ground floor, uh, experience the museum, and then decide whether or not you were interested in paying to go up to the upper levels. These are additional shots. These are glamour shots uh, from when we originally opened the building. And of course, uh, what one notes immediately is the striking blue interior. So the tent structure of the, of the organization of the building is painted blue inside as a cue to let you know where you are in relation to the exterior of the building almost at any given time. The image on the right is an image of that programming space that is um, roughly 25 feet high um, and has these diagonal windows that sort of cut through that themselves are mirrored on the interior. So they reflect light into the space in really unusual ways. Um, and this is another shot looking down, speaking uh, to Merida's presentation that induces some problematic <laughs> sensory responses, especially if someone has vertigo. Um, there are definitely sights along the stair uh, that create an, uh, an uncomfortable sense of, um, of geometry and, and space. Uh, and these are just a few additional shots at left. This is the interior stair, which is yellow. Uh, and it's a very different experience. It's also a sound installation space. Um, at bottom right, I draw your attention. This is an empty shot of the building's ground floor from uh, where you would enter the building. And this is really where uh, I wanna kind of start my conversation. Uh, this is also a shot of the gallery, uh, just so everyone has the opportunity. So the ground floor and the entire museum was designed with three key principles in mind, flexibility, sustainability, um, and transparency. Uh, and so this is an image actually of our store space, um, which uh, you'll see highlights one key element of the ground floor, which is flexibility. Um, the idea of the institution at 34,000 square feet was that every space could be converted into a different space for a variety of purposes and that no space was truly fixed. Um, and so the store set up as normal could be completely put away. You see at right an entire bank of cabinetry. All of these um, uh, cabinets that are holding stock can close up with doors and they go into that bank on the right. And then this was a um, space rental event. So the flexibility of the space was was a principal importance for us for our uh, earned income program. Um, and so the environment on the ground floor was always conceived with mobility and modularity in mind. All of the furniture could be moved and changed um, and nothing was sort of fixed in space. Once we opened the building, uh, we took some early visitor satisfaction surveys. And this is one example of, a, you know, maybe after a, of a week's response to that survey. And the good news was uh, people um, ha the visit al always met or exceeded their expectations with, you know, with, with a high majority um, and that generally speaking, most people would recommend the experience. So in terms of, um, of our goals of increasing um, visitor satisfaction and, and creating an experience that was meaningful, we were, we were reaching our goals. But when we asked more specific questions, um, such as this one, did you stop at the Mocha dining cart during your visit today? Um, overwhelmingly, the answer was no, or more problematically, I didn't even know that was there. Or did you spend time watching the introductory video that was right by the front door that we so, you know, we so, so shrewdly put there? Again, no, I didn't, and I'm not sure where that was. Um, we, in our surveys and our conversations with um, our audiences, we began to get a sense of the fact that the ground floor was working really successfully for certain things 
that our users needed and really poorly for others. So success was programs. So here you see a, a town hall style event in the round. Um, here is a fashion show um, uh, event and these are children using the space for learning. So programmed experiences where we could modulate and control the space and lay it out and in most cases where it was filled with audience felt very inviting. Um, however, um, the experience of the space, oh, and also um, the porousness to the outside um, was important to us. So this is a view of the building down the block. Uh, this was a concert by Mark Mothersbaugh, where you get a sense of the relationship of the building to its surroundings. Um, and just at the end of that alley is the, is the Cleveland Muse uh, Institute of Art. Um, but what we realized was we were not creating an urban living room style experience for our daily visitors. People coming into the space to have a more casual experience, um, it, was, it was falling short. Um, more problematically, it was also falling short um, in terms of an accessibility um, uh, perspective. And um, I love that, Meredith, you put up the universal design principles because those actually informed some of the changes. Um, so one of our first uh, approaches to um, improving the sense of welcome and invitation and encouraging people to linger in the space was through art. So here you see a view of the building right when we opened it. Um, and there is a mural by Katarina Grossa that she did on the atrium spine called Third Man Begins Digging Through Her Pockets. Uh, this was a way for us to indicate to the outside that there was art inside the building. Um, we began to explore moving art into that program space that I showed you earlier, that double high space. And you'll note in this image at right, there now is an addition of a curtain that was not originally in, in the space. Um, those diagonal windows, awesome as they are, would create a raking light on the wall where we project um, images or pre presentations. Um, and it really prevented us from doing certain events at certain times of the year. Uh, so we had to add the curtains. That wall, I should mention, is a leaning wall. Uh, it leans in. So it's very difficult to find uh, any sort of blinds. And then we added video art into that space. So here you see Jennifer Steinkamp's work, Judy Crook 4, which is a, a sort of whirling dervish tree that moves in the space. We uh, moved some furniture that we had had in other areas into that environment, some of our existing cafe tables, some soft seating, sort of Tetris style. Um, everything that we bought for the building when we opened it furniture wise was black and white. The palette of the building was essentially black, white, and then the blue and the yellow of the interior uh, walls and stair were the accents and the sort of punches of color. Um, we also explored other ways to use art in the atrium space. So here you see a, an inflatable sculpture um, that would actually breathe, it would inflate and deflate. Um, and create a different sensorial experience for visitors as they move from the um, entryway into the store. So you see there the revolving door where one enters the space um, and then the store is just to your left as you enter. So it created a more dynamic experience um, for visitors in that moment. Um, but we still were struggling to make something that people uh, wanted to experience. There you see an image of our Cafe cart, this went through so many iterations um, to try and get the right fit of food offerings and, and cladding. This was when we put shelves behind it to try and make it seem like more inviting and we added high tops and cafe tables. Um, this was a real loss. Um, it, it became clear to us that people were not interested in coming into the building for food. Um, and after about three years of trying, we let go of the cart and the food service. Um, but the big change that happened um, that we initiated in 2017 and realized in 2018 was an actual redesign of the ground floor. And I want to just note that all of this work in trying to create this welcoming experience is also balanced by a lot of programming attentiveness. Um, and so I'm speaking only of spatial and architectural shifts, um, but we, uh, we also were doing a lot of engagement practices and work to try and create um, opportunities for people programmatically to feel welcome in the space. Uh, here you see an, an overview of the space before we made the changes and um, you see the main entry here. Uh, it was a very short walk to the front desk, like maybe eight steps. Um, and then the ticket area was right here. There was a door that you went into to find the restrooms and we had a set of lockers in there um, and a coat room. This is, the, this is the welcome desk that you would have uh, confronted when you went into the building initially. It was a high desk. 
So the, um, our welcome desk associate sat low behind it. It came up, it was higher than counter high, almost bar height, um, and uh, was a really crisp long line. This is another view. Uh, so it was, it read like just a small perforation in this continuation of a wall. Um, and then you see that uh, screen at your right around that corner would take you into the, um, to the public programming space. This is um, how we changed it. So we realized that that experience was really abrupt. When you think about the exterior of the building, um, it is very um, imposing and also reflective. So people can't actually see inside. And that coupled with the fact that there's not um, a lot of signage that indicates um, exactly what the building is on all sides. We have a lot of people that circulate the building multiple times just to find the front door. Um, once they entered, if they weren't prepared for their visit, it was um, very intimidating for them to immediately stumble upon this desk to have their, the associates low behind the desk. And it was particularly difficult for people who use mobility devices like wheelchairs who might themselves be lower seated. So in rethinking the welcome, uh, the welcome space, uh, we decided to eliminate the locker room uh, and then push back the welcome center as far as we could uh, and then lower the desk. So when um, Meredith was talking about design, um, universal design principles, principle six and seven, low physical effort and size and space for use was really important to us in rethinking how this circulation could work uh, more productively for our audiences who use mobility devices. This also allowed our visitor engagement associates to, to uh, be more at eye level, to uh, create an opportunity for people to see the whole space when they walked in. So now you have views into the Gun Commons uh, programming area. Um, and it also warmed the space up. We put a, a, a sort of beige uh, carpeting down, added some lower lighting. So that space became warmer um, and a bit more uh, welcoming. Here you see um, an exchange and you can see through those um, people into the back where a program is being set up allowed a lot more visibility into the space here again from another angle. Um, and then this is another angle that shows you from the opposite side. That desk actually also included a, a bump in that allows people who use wheelchairs to pull into that space. We also added a um, table that was a similar height elsewhere that allowed people to use the table um, for computer use to encourage students to stay. Uh, the other thing we added importantly was soft, colorful furniture. Uh, we found that the black and white and the hard surfaces were really um, made the experience of the space cold, literally physically cold. Um, so we um, added these very punchy, bright, soft, um, plush furnishings that allow people um, to relax in the space, basically the way one would want to do in their living room. And here you see an image of that happening. Um, some of these Bartoya chairs that people can lean back in and spend uh, a longer amount of time. Uh, finally, what we did was we changed our art approach, which was an important shift. And rather than doing video in our programming space, which created a dark, kind of uninviting environment, even if the work was really interesting, we decided to shift to a large scale mural project uh, where we would invite artists to do site specific works uh, in the space and then amplify the lighting to create a really invigorating ground floor art experience. This was our first installation with Claudia Compt, zigzags and diagonals. We took that all the way through the ground floor space. So you see her here, her treatment on other surfaces um, of the building. Uh, subsequent to Claudia, Kathy Opie did a work called Inside Out, which was a large scale photo installation um, of images of Lake Erie, which also transformed the space into a familiar and inviting kind of natural environment. Um, and I'll show you one last one. Just to close, I wanna note um, things are different now. Uh, unfortunately, based on the um, impact of the pandemic, we have had to shift our ground floor experience yet again. Uh, but our change was really instrumental in creating a more inviting opportunity for our visitors. Now we actually have people entering through our former store space, which is a visitor registration zone where we take health screenings and have all of our engagement guides behind plexiglass glass barriers. This is a temporary solution. We are very much looking forward to getting back to the time when we can invite people back into our original welcome center. Uh, but amusingly, and prior to the pandemic, this was the installation that we put up into our public art space. Uh, and so we like to think that indeed, uh, there will become a time when everything 
is going to be all right in relation to our health ability to gather in this space together and to have those sort of welcoming uh, experiences um, with one another. So. Thank you so much. And thank you for ending on a positive note. <laughs> um, next, uh, Chris, Christopher Alt, along with Christiana Moss, is a principal of Studio Ma, which has risen to national prominence for emotionally resonant and intellectually taught architecture. Alton Moss studied architecture at Cornell and with the Pittsburgh Prize Award winner, Sarah Spen. After working in New York, they moved to Phoenix and founded Studio Ma in 2003. Living in the desert Southwest has profoundly shaped their practice. Do you need more? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited. Uh, thank you for for having me speak uh, what is evening here in Phoenix and um, different times around the uh, four panelists here and I'm sure some of the attendees as well. Um, what I'm talking about today, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, I'm presenting about uh, our chapter in your book, Georgia, which I just recommend to everybody who's attending how interesting uh, the different chapters are and how diverse the content is. I think it's truly remarkable for its collection of uh, interesting ideas related to museums. So um, I think it's, uh, it's worth delving into and I encourage everybody to um, watch the other webinars as well. Uh, my uh, talk here is about uh, triple bottom line sustainable design. And it's in the context of a specific example of a museum that we did uh, for the city of Scottsdale and the Scottsdale Museum of the West. And uh, a little bit about uh, Studio Mob before I jump in, we're uh, an architecture firm based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we've been recognized uh, nationally and internationally and we like to uh, think of our work as an inspiring en environment for all uh, that's built for joy within and for and with function throughout ma is understood as the space between and that's a concept that uh, speaks to the idea that anytime you make something you immediately and automatically create a relationship between that and the environment that it sits within. And it's probably most easily understood as uh, when you make a, let's say you're using a uh, potter's wheel and you're turning clay on that wheel and you form it into a vessel, you, you, you're making a form and at the same time you're containing space within that form. And so that is the kind of idea of ma. And the Museum of the West is a, is a uh, perfect example that I could speak in, in that regard. Um, to just show you a few of the final uh, photographs of the building before I get into the, the chapter specifically, um, this is in uh, Old Town Scottsdale. Uh, this is a view of the entrance from the Southeast. And you can see that it uh, consists of a, a large overhanging front porch that uh, greets the primary street to the east, which is on the right hand side, and also a public plaza uh, to the south, which is uh, off to the left side of the screen. And you're looking toward the uh, main entry lobby. This is a view looking down the street from Scottsdale Road. So this would be the view that uh, people would see um, as they're moving up and down uh, the main uh, street in Scottsdale. Uh, and then some closer shots uh, as you make your way toward the entrance, depicting some of the uh, materials that we uh, used on the building and some of the detailing that you can see on the um, steel plate uh, floor as you approach the entry doors. This is the main lobby space. You could see we used uh, cedar uh, wood wall paneling on the 
uh, on the surfaces behind the uh, visitor, uh, the ticketing desk. And we also used um, uh, Western red cedar for the uh, planking that you see on the desk itself. It's a view of uh, one of the two staircases that serve the second level. And this is a, one of the primary areas where we introduce daylight into the building. A typical gallery space, this one happens to be on the second floor in one of the, uh, ultimately what it turned out to be a permanent collection and a view of the outdoor courtyard. And I'll get into these a little bit further as I go on. I, what I thought could be interesting is to take the chapter and uh, as it's written in the book as a kind of invitation for those who've not read uh, the chapter to, um, to do so. And also to give you some of the thinking that, that goes behind. And so this, I, I thought given that this is a small forum and uh, we might enjoy a little more intimate dialogue that um, I could give you some of the thinking that went into the uh, the final text that's in the book. Uh, and so these are kind of my uh, margin notes, if you will. I thought it'd be an interesting take to the uh, more typical polished presentation. So I hope you don't mind. If you want to see the polished presentation, I invite you to look at the photographs on our website. Um, so the triple bottom line speaks to really three areas of uh, sustainability, uh, the economic, social, and, and the building itself. And though the building uh, we're quite proud of and has been you know, very well received, it's received design awards, um, is notable. The, the area I really think was per perhaps most uh, progressive in the project was really the kind of economic aspect of it and the social aspect. Uh, and those two are really intertwined. Uh, Scottsdale, just a little background uh, is proud to consider itself the west most western town uh, and they're they're proud of that and this there's a lot of kind of um, uh, quaint galleries and historic uh, shops that line the old town Scottsdale area and that's right where this building was situated um, and from the outset the uh, the city wanted the um, this location to be used for a cultural facility. The uh, problem was that there was really insufficient funds. The city had limited funds and there was no major donor signed up for the project. And so in a kind of a true Western spirit, the, the city set out to issue an RFP for a, uh, an entity to, to run such a museum. Um, and rather than uh, constructing a very expensive uh, building, the, uh, the thinking was to, on our part, was to um, approach this uh, from the, the opposite end of the spectrum. And so you can see examples of um, the American Folk Art Museum in New York City, which had to close. Um, and the museum had similar funding issues and other places that spent very little on architecture such as uh, Marfa, Texas or the Museum of Jurassic Technology, the, the lesser known, um, have done quite well even without significant spending in, in architecture. So uh, the founders of the museum really made financial success kind of the highest priority. Um, the uh, area around, around Scottsdale, a little context, uh, this is a map of, uh, of Old Town, and this is right in the, uh, what's considered the arts and, and cultural district and the blue area. Here's an image of uh, the kind of small single story galleries uh, that form the uh, area around the, the museum. And down here is an aerial showing uh, the broader context and Camelback Mountain off to the Northwest there. So today, you know, Scottsdale is roughly 250,000 people. Uh, however, the, the metro area is 
is closer to five million. It's it's quite large uh, and and spread out. But so in the overall area, it's a very busy area. And a lot of people fly in and out of Phoenix, um, visit a few of the local sites, and then head off toward other destinations in the state. And one of the aspirations of the museum is to attract some of those visitors before they do leave um, leave the area and head north to the canyon or other places. Um, but the, the idea originated with uh, Mayor Herb Drinkwater and the idea uh, was prompted from the community, but Mayor Herb Drinkwater really spearheaded the concept, uh, approached Mike Fox, who at the time uh, this goes back a number of years. Um, at the time, he was director of the Heard Museum, which is a notable museum of uh, the Native American located in downtown Phoenix. Uh, he approached Mike Fox about this, and Mike Fox had a very interesting concept. It, it's almost the stone soup uh, story, if you will, but he really had no collection, uh, no finances, uh, no site, and, and just had an idea. And the idea I think was so beautiful about it is it's very much the kind of uh, Western spirit, if you will, of uh, uh, almost westward expansion, the idea that you can create something. And so that really the, the idea of creating a museum uh, out of really nothing was uh, a brilliant uh, concept that Mike Fox uh, talked about with uh, Mayor Drinkwater eventually the city of Scottsdale issued an RFP for a museum operator. Mike Fox's team ended up winning that uh, uh, competition. And you can see uh, this is Mike Fox here on the right. And uh, Jim Bruner is a museum chairman who was very instrumental in uh, sustaining the continued um, uh, force from the, the community to get this project done. They're standing here uh, on a shot in front of one of the the museum's walls uh, that that utilizes uh, tilt panel construction, uh, so this is taken on the job site. Uh, the the site for this building, uh, as you see in the lower right, this is a former uh, transit hub that the city decided to build that was not successful and was eventually closed. Uh, this was a transit site that was built under what's called the hub and spoke concept for transportation, which doesn't work in a city like Phoenix because everything is so spread out and we're on a grid system. So um, that closed and it was really a derelict uh, part of Old Town. And so people would come to this area of the city uh, on foot visiting galleries and such, and they would encounter this scene and they would turn around and go the other direction, even though there are uh, additional destinations southward, including the Scottsdale Art School. But this this site here was really a vacant lot and uh, a derelict location. So uh, a little bit about the kind of economic sustainability, it's important to look at museum costs generally. And as you see in the highlighted text, the, a museum such as the African American History Museum in Washington, DC uh, is anywhere from a high-end large museum like that is anywhere from 700 to 950 dollars a square foot and I've kind of made a simple graph over here so a high-end museum you can see is approaching a thousand dollars a square foot a medium quality museum ranges from five to 650 a low end is anywhere from 350 to 500 the Shrem Museum of Art, which is selected and, and, and noted here, just simply because it utilized a similar contracting and delivery method, uh, was budgeted at around 400, ended up closer to 1,000. All very interesting. And I, I think that the, the most important aspect of this is that it's really a tragedy when a museum has to close because they can't afford their building. Uh, the very idea that you would overspend on your building to the point that you could no longer keep your doors open is, is obviously uh, counterproductive to the intention of the museum. Uh, the Museum of the West, uh, when all was said and done, was just over $300 a square foot, which is really unheard of for a museum of its caliber and for the kind of facility that was constructed. 
The project was also completed uh, in approximately three years uh, from design through construction, which is, which was, which is quick by uh, average museum uh, durations. You can see the graph here. The Museum of the West is a, a low bar. Um, the, one of the important things that I just wanted to point out is that this wasn't done through uh, slashing the project requirements or slashing the program or cutting things out of the project, but the original published uh, space program in the RFP was uh, at 40,000 square feet. And the final program area was at very close to 40,000 square feet uh, of interior condition space. That does not include the outdoor space that is a functional and programmatic part of the building, the courtyard, which is really central to the experience of the museum, but is also used as a sculpture courtyard and a place for events. Um, a, a note about the delivery. This is extremely rare in the museum, if not unprecedented in the museum world. So typically the, the, the client contracts separately with the architect and the builder. The city and the city decided to do this project as a design build agreement. And that's really important to understand because it, you can see the typical contract, the client is in between the architect and the builder. And everything the uh, architect is doing has to be filtered through the client to get back to the builder and vice versa. And though traditionally that method is used to ensure a high quality design and to uphold project standards, what's interesting about the design build contract on this project was that the city chose to use a, a pre, uh, a two phase design build contract. So the pre-design phase was where we set the project standards and we arrived at all of the basis of design criteria for the facility. Once those were determined, the budget was fixed and the architect and the builder became jointly responsible to deliver that for the promised budget. The, neither the city nor the private partner uh, would be asked to uh, provide additional funding unless it was for something that was outside the original scope of work. And this was a very clever uh, contracting method, uh, though rare. Uh, I think it was quite successful. The Studio Ma project team listed here on the bottom right, uh, you can see that under the general contractor, that was a partnership between a contractor that Studio Ma had worked with previously, Core Construction and LGE Design Build. And LGE design build was important because they construct uh, basically uh, tilt up office buildings and had zero experience in museums whatsoever and in civic buildings of any nature. But they, what they brought was the idea that uh, we would have to use tilt up construction and uh, light steel framing in order to meet the project budget. So Studio Ma embraced the idea and you can see on the, on the image on the left there, there's a kind of typical use of tilt-up construction. Uh, it's used for parking structures, exteriors, it's used for warehouses. It's typically not used for museums. And uh, Studio Ma embraced the idea that uh, we could work with this construction methodology and play with making form uh, using this as an idea, but also to really uh, explore the idea of texturing that concrete in ways that would evoke uh, its, its history of place, uh, the kind of genius loci of Phoenix in the Southwest, um, and also create uh, opportunities for self-shading. You can see on the, the ribbing on these concrete panels, this is a mock-up on the job site, that that ribbing uh, it creates a shadow effect by the spaces between those and helps to shade the building and reduce its energy consumption. The idea for the building, uh, as I mentioned, there's a central courtyard. Here's an image in the top left of that, of that space. Um, this is really central. I, a lot of visitors to museums are disoriented and get lost. And uh, they have a feeling like you get this museum fatigue. And so we came up with this idea that like horseshoes around 
uh, the stake, the galleries could pinwheel around a central organizing space, which is that courtyard uh, that works three dimensionally, both for the lower galleries and upper galleries. The ideas for the exterior using simple materials were inspired by uh, basket weaving, uh, Native American concepts of weaving, and also this traditional Western fence called a snake fence. You can see the patterning and folding of these metal panels creates an interesting shadow and three-dimensional effect. And the ribbing on these uh, tilt-up concrete wall panels evoke the, the same way that the ribbing on the saguaro cactus works to help self-shade that plant uh, and also give it room to expand and contract as the uh, water inside, uh, as it fills up or releases water. Uh, there's a playful approach to the patterning and the concrete around the building and you saw it in the steel plate there at the front door. This is uh, an idea that comes from the tooling on the leather saddles uh, that cowboys have. And you see that same kind of patterning uh, used on, uh, on uh, pistols, on the pistol grips. It's very decorative and uh, interesting uh, history to this. And so working with the landscape architect, we worked on this, uh, this patterning in the concrete and the floor surfaces in the building. One area we, we focused on, and we tried to find spaces that could be multi-use rather than single use to help the museum stay uh, flexible and, and program spaces as their needs change. And that came from using in the auditorium using rather than constructing a sloped floor or built-in seating, uh, we used expandable seating on a flat floor. And so the museum hosts dinner events or uh, they'll actually hold board meetings in here uh, or at a round table setting. And uh, overhead, we developed these cedar panels cut into the form of a saddle, a three-dimensional saddle. That saddle form comes both from uh, landscapes, as you can see, the, these, are, these are called saddles. For, for those of you who are outdoors, outdoors you, you hike, you, you know this. Uh, but some people don't know that term, and that's basically where two hills and two uh, in two different directions come together, and that saddle form became the inspiration uh, for the ceiling overhead inside that auditorium. Some additional shots that you can see here into the auditorium with the seating extended, and that space connects uh, through this sliding barn, barn door uh, to that courtyard. The, uh, the stairs, as I mentioned, they're one of the primary uh, entry points for daylight. So we developed uh, high clear stories that bring light all the way through down to the lower level. And um, uh, sorry, um, a shot of the uh, tilt panels in construction being, being hoisted up. You can see some of the wood actually stuck to the forms and that had to be removed and in the process of removing and, and, and uh, taking cleaning the, the, the forms off actually broke those ribs and created a very uh, random and beautiful effect. It, was, it couldn't have been planned any better to have that randomness uh, uh, occur on the panels. With regard to actual measurable sustainability, uh, the museum uh, did achieve a lead gold standard uh, part of our process included evaluating five separate schemes and uh, working with the city and the museum operator to select not only what was programmatically the best scheme, but also the highest performing scheme in terms of estimated energy consumption based on form and orientation. And of course, uh, the galleries with those clear stories uh, were of uh, important concern for the museum and for Studio Ma. We use daylighting uh, software to model and analyze such that uh, we ensured uh, that no uh, excessive amounts of daylight or UV was entering any of the gallery spaces. 
in the end, uh, Studio Ma, the, the building, working with the engineer uh, closely, uh, we achieved a 38% reduction from the national average uh, museum. And the future is planned at a 60% energy reduction. It is a solar ready building uh, when they're ready to take that step. Water is precious in the desert uh, as it is in most places. Um, this uh, building consumes 40% less water than the baseline. And you can see here, uh, this is what's called the weeping wall. All of the condensate water uh, from the museum's air handlers uh, is collected and becomes a part of this uh, water feature in the courtyard and feeds not only the garden in the courtyard, but also a bioswale on the south side of the building, saving a lot of uh, irrigation water. Here you can see that bioswale on the south side and uh, the, the water from the condensate units uh, flows into here as well as storm water uh, during rain events. One of the ways uh, social uh, sustainability is accomplished is this is, I liked uh, the, the presentation that Megan, you talked about an eight-sided building. You got me there. Ours is five, uh, which, which most buildings have. Um, but we considered every possible vantage for this building, understanding that it was in a complex urban environment and that visitors would be approaching from any direction. And so to that, it was really important to us that all sides of the building were designed, that there would be no back, and that even the roof would be considered for views from the adjacent uh, buildings, which were taller. And so there's really no back to this building. And these images on the screen, uh, the top left image is a view of the mechanical yard. And it's uh, also the area, there's a parking structure below the building and you come up on this back side, and you enter around, you, you walk this way around the building. And so this was composed very carefully uh, to make it another beautiful location of the building with landscape and the same treatment to the building's exterior. Uh, the view on the top right is, is I'm sorry, I'm over time. Yeah, it's, it's, we want to make sure we have time for All right, I will, so, um, I will, maybe we can, um, I will finish come up back. In, I think, I think I'm just later. about done. Uh, okay. To wrap it up, um, it so was uh, uh, the fastest facility ever to receive uh, its status as a Smithsonian Museum affiliate in just six months from the date of completion. And it has spawned future expansion plans for not only the museum, but also the entire south area of Old Town, which was completely undeveloped. So it has achieved that economic sustainability as well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm over. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. All right, so next up, um, last but certainly not least, Daniel P. Gottlieb directs the transformation of the North Carolina Museum of Arts 164 acre campus from prison site into a cultural destination, integrating art, recreation, and sustainable design. And he oversees architecture, landscape, and environmental design. He co-curates the museum park sculpture program. He's also an exhibiting artist working in photo-generated mixed media exploring human relationships to nature and time. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting there. You've got your screen, but not your How's there? Yeah. Yes, please. Well, hello, everybody. Um, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wh wherever you are. Um, and thank you for three great presentations. I hope I can live up to that. Um, so this, I hope it's not a pretentiously titled uh, uh, title for my chapter in George's wonderful book um, called Design for Citizenship, which is, uh, um, if you'll bear with me as we go through here on a very brief tour of uh, my overseeing a transformation of a museum and its site. Um, it's also kind of a personal story of my own transformation from an exhibition designer and a builder of exhibitions and an artist to um, one whose consciousness, I hope, um, grew a little bit of ambition too with an idea of changing perhaps what an art museum might be with certain opportunities. 
if I can get it to change, it's going to change it. Oh. So the North Carolina Museum of Art, that's where I work. Uh, and for oh, a good 30 years now, it's a pretty unusual museum. We have a pretty fantastic and encyclopedic uh, traditional collection. Uh, but more than that, we have 164 acres that is now a place for art, a place for performance, a place for gathering um, in a quite an unusual way. This is a museum that started out uh, rather modestly and uh, with a good collection, but in an old highway building in downtown sleepy North Raleigh, North Carolina, um, whose population at that time was uh, all of 66,000 people. It's now an extremely thriving uh, region called the Research Triangle, which includes Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, which is packed full of universities and tech and all of that kind of thing. But it started out here um, and almost immediately started planning for a purpose-built um, building for it, for this museum. And so there, this was also the um, the first state-owned in the United States, state-owned and operated uh, art museum uh, because North Carolina did not have much of a Gilded Age wealth like Cleveland and many other places. Um, and so uh, the state assumed some of the cultural responsibilities that would otherwise be privately driven. Well, they picked a site you know, after much controversy that was a rather odd site on the edge of this uh, still pretty sleepy but growing town that had a hundred years of uh, pretty checkered past uh, beginning with uh, a military base and then converting from the United States government ownership to state ownership as a series of prisons uh, ending with the Uc uh, sorry, the Polk Youth Detention Center uh, which remained open all the way until the year 2000, if you can believe that. So uh, this is back in 1970s and the, uh, the Art Building Commission uh, uh, selected uh, Edward Durrell Stone, um, who you probably know, he was an extremely world famous international style architect, uh, his first museum building was as co-designer of the Museum of Modern Art. This was his last, although he died before um, construction even began. And what he designed was this 400,000 square foot Indiana lime clone, limestone clad uh, building with uh, this geometric um, manipulation of these squares uh, with rooftop gardens and this giant reflecting pool as this kind of utopian vision of a museum in a park on what would someday be a large museum campus. Well, he died. The project came in at about 400% over budget. And by the time it opened in 1983, this is what it looked like. Now I'll point out that the building in the back is the museum. Uh, those buildings in the front are the prison. This is Polk Youth Detention Center. And I point that out because many people thought that the building looked pretty much like an expansion of the prison as an opaque uh, kind of uh, foreboding structure. In the, in the, on the far right, you see uh, the original smokestack, which is now 100 years old and is the only remaining piece of architecture from the original um, prison buildings. Oh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, a few years after the dust settled on getting into that building and trying to squeeze the collection and programs into a building that was uh, only 40% of what was intended to be. My immediate predecessor, who was the chief designer along with the chief curator, cooked up a plan uh, to have a national competition to imagine what this museum could be if it had all of this land and ran this competition, which had to include an artist along with uh, design professionals. And so the winning team was the artist Barbara Kruger, along with architects Hiss Smith Miller Hawkinson and Nicholas Cornell, all New York based. And what they came up with was this um, rather conceptual framework um, for uh, an expanded museum on territory that the museum didn't quite 
have control of yet. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'll point out if you can, I'll show you these uh, zones that were um, suggested. Here's the building where it in fact was with a, surrounded by an active zone and a, what they call the passive zone where you would uh, over time restore some of it and put in some trails and they imagine a driving path around it. But the prison still existed at that time. Well, I heard of this because it was well published uh, and I read about it in design circles. And so when the then museum director asked if I'd be interested in being uh, the chief designer, I accepted the invitation to go talk to them. And when I arrived, well, it still looked exactly the same, um, which I knew, but seeing it uh, in person with prisoners being marched between those uh, fences of barbed wire was uh, kind of a shock that I remember as if it was yesterday. And my reaction was, well, oh my God, uh, yes, I'll take the job. And so I did, and over the coming few years, I began to develop a kind of idea that really sprang from imperfect utopia um, that was based on this kind of principle where if this museum could apply the kind of standards of stewardship that it does to its own collection towards this other amazing priceless um, land that it sat upon, these 164 acres, which would eventually be deeded over to the museum, uh, to uh, restore it environmentally and socially, uh, which to a highly degraded site, in essence, to create a park, then it can attract a much larger and I thought even more diverse audience to build organizational sustainability with a larger audience and move beyond what we all know is the rather narrow demographic that traditionally goes to traditional art museums, which um, by all accounts is roughly about 5% of any metropolitan area on average as frequent users, whereas parks attract something like 50% of population. So that the opportunity was rather unparalleled. And by doing that, um, the, the museum could also add to the community and thereby be quote unquote, a better citizen. Well, I um, recontacted or contacted for the first time that uh, design team that produced Imperfect Utopia and I invited them back to do something. I had a, a donor that supported this effort to build an amphitheater just outside of the museum and Barbara Kruger, this is a collaborative project. So it's a hybrid between art and function. And you can see these very large letters parading across the landscape as Barbara Kruger called them, uh, the textualized landscape spelling out picture of this. Each letter is about 80 feet uh, high here. And so it's a performance space, it's a concert space and an outdoor uh, film screen. And it became kind of, um, as Nicholas Cornell called it, a hinge to the landscape, which is very prophetic. It, uh, in that it turned the corner, if you will, from a very introspective fortress-like environment, traditional, yes, black box gallery, towards the future, looking at what the possibilities might be in expanding and extroverting the museum, if you will. It was just a couple of years after that, another opportunity came along where the Department of Transportation approached me, hey, could we put a greenway, a multi-purpose bikeway through a corner of your property. Well, the director was a very influential guy and we ended up kind of uh, bamboozling the Department of Transportation at two or three years worth of budget. And we ended up building this uh, 750 foot pedestrian bridge which linked us to the university district uh, and brought uh, this greenway in through the campus in a little bit circuitous way on land that was really not even a museum yet. It was still deeded to the Department of Corrections uh, to build this greenway um, and thereby was a metaphorically kind of a handshake to the community uh, and allowing people to approach a museum campus by something other than automobile, but also forming what would become a spine of the future park. So fast forward a bit, 
um, this decade between 2000 and 2010, uh, the museum was still operating in its traditional way and with no programming, no marketing, no promotion whatsoever, uh, people started to come. And with uh, um, my collaborator, one of the curators at my museum, we began to find a, a, some funds here and there to, um, to begin an art program. I formed a partnership with a local university uh, called the Partnership for Art and Ecology to begin to educate me and uh, a couple of other people about how to manage a park and how we might think about it ecologically as well as uh, culturally. However, during the same period, exact same period, my actual real job was um, to oversee the programming, the planning and design of uh, a new building, a new container for the great collection uh, that we had and to complete the picture from the incompleted original Edward Jarrell stone picture. And so we hired Thomas Pfeiffer and partners. And I worked with them for that period of time to design and uh, I oversaw the, uh, the construction and the move in of the collection into this building, which um, turned out to be the exact embodiment of uh, the formal end of the spectrum from formal to informal in this elegant space where the central idea of this building was to invite natural light safely, and that's a, I could talk to you for an hour about that, uh, into every single gallery and no galleries having four walls so that you could look across time and culture um, in every opportunity uh, throughout the whole museum. And then the museum and the galleries itself would have these cutouts of these elegant courtyards. So the uh, collection began to express itself into these courtyards and the courtyards into the landscape that surround it um, to begin to set up this dialogue between the very formal through the programmatic zone of the museum to the very informal encounters with art. And so, uh, as we heard with our previous presenters, people learn in different ways. There are different ways uh, to think about in, uh, uh, sustainability, um, economically for sure, environmentally is at top of mind, but socially as well. And so to hit all three of those, of those pieces through this larger campus, through the connection of these, these three kinds of elements and also recognize that people learn in different ways and that not everybody uh, feels welcome uh, in a highbrow art museum or something that's so elegant, yet to provide a series of passageways to become familiar with contemporary art in the landscape, invite them to participate in programs you know, on the campus um, and eventually make their way in through the doors and vice versa, it began to work. This was also the start of getting serious about environmentalism. That West building uh, was also LEED certified and it was tied to a very um, expansive uh, idea of stormwater management. This is uh, some views of a very sculptural stormwater detention pond that we built that is linked to the museum. We capture 100% of uh, the stormwater uh, around the whole 50 acre site of the building, which we then have expanded throughout the whole campus where we are 100% uh, managed for our stormwater um, program. Fast forwarding a little bit uh, to 2014, again, we still didn't have any programming uh, or promotion or marketing within the campus, but as people began to come more and more, um, we did some surveys and there was a distinct um, perception gap, if you will, between park and museum, where those who were using the park did not perceive it as part of the museum and people who were going to the museum were like, what park? So when I had the opportunity with uh, one of our chief benefactors to do something about that, I wanted to see what, if we can pull those two realms together and then pull it up to the street front into what was uh, the abandoned, by now it, the prison was raised, um, and, but it was just an abandoned uh, um, prison site at that point, pretty ugly up along the whole street front. 
And so I brought on uh, a really great um, firm, Civitas, out of Denver. Um, and in 2016, we opened up these beautiful landscapes with a new arrival parking, wave gardens, this elliptical lawn that is designed uh, without program, but as a frame for programs and art. Um, and to invite people uh, in, a, again, the series and this other access from, for, from urban into this pastoral environment. We opened with uh, this, this really fun um, installation by Amanda Pereira. We broke all museum records uh, for the two weeks that it was here. Um, and uh, it kind of catalyzed it and this new landscape catalyzed an amazing growth uh, in visitation to the museum. Um, and so much so that the staff finally woke up to, hey, what do we have going on here? And so we now have two full departments doing programming and education um, and an active program of, uh, of temporary and permanent works uh, on the campus. And uh, the environmentalism continues where my chief project uh, today and for the next uh, year or more will be in doing an environmental master plan for the remainder of this 50 acres where we're looking at stream restoration, forest restoration, pulling it all together. And we're working with the environmentally based uh, firm Andre Pogon uh, to complete this master plan. So where are we? This is a little bit of a snapshot. You can see in the upper part of the column that um, the visitation to the galleries uh, has uh, grown um, almost 100%, not quite, um, except for this tragic year uh, with the pandemic where it has been mostly closed. Whereas with the park, it has grown uh, um, almost exponentially. Um, last year in 2019, we had 700,000 visitors coming to the park. Uh, by the way, the whole campus is free ex except for special exhibitions. And then in this year of the pandemic, a million people have come since the lockdown to this park because this community has found solace. They found, they found a place to be with one another, with their families or by themselves, but in a place that felt safe and a place that felt well special to the community. And I think most special to me and most rewarding to me is that it's a much more diverse population that is visiting the museum now. And uh, as a benefit of this, um, while the museum is closed and our finances have really struggled, our membership has gone up this year. We're, and it's due uh, from all accounts to appreciation of the community for this uh, community asset. So um, have we become a better citizen? Well, um, I, I, I do think we have, uh, but it's my own biased view. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, so it's really running up against the end of time, um, but I wanted to see, so I just wanted to, officially close and then if anyone has any questions maybe they can hang out a little bit longer but, um, so i just wanted to say thank you to all of the panelists it's been such a pleasure and um thank you to everyone who attended if anyone has any questions you can feel free to get in touch with me and i'll pop a link um to to my own profile so that you can find my email address um, and then also just, again, if you're interested in reading more about contemporary museum architecture and design, you can pick up the book and you can read more about, I mean, everyone here presented a sort of a, a small portion of the, the depth um, that they could go into in the chapters. So if anyone wants to pick up the book and, and read more, and then there's also um, uh, 14 other um, authors who have equally interesting complex ideas about museum environments. So. I welcome anyone um, picking that up, discount code, it's a little more affordable. So um, I think that should be the official official end of the panel. We've run up against the time, but if anyone does have any questions, um, feel free to, to open them. Feel, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. Um, we have one person that just said that was amazing. Thank you. So thank you, panelists. 
Um, you can also pop it in the chat box. And I just, as sort of um, a brief, I just would love to ask um, Chris and Meredith, Dan, you really talked about how the pandemic has impacted the MCM from the Farm Museum of Art. Meredith, how is the, do you have any updates to your thinking about the, you know, inclusive design now that here we are, <laughs> sadly, most, most of a year into a pandemic that has really altered the way we move in space? And, and Chris, you know, what are your thoughts about this? Any updates to your chapters now that we are on this side of COVID? Well, sure, I can jump in, Georgia. I, I mean, essentially, what the pandemic has done is sort of cut off our sensory experience with a with a, a building for sure, where it becomes um, actually life threatening to touch or to inhale. Um, and so we we use devices to even you know further create barriers um, between us and the building. And and so. Um, what I've how I've seen the response is either, um, and I, I have to say I have I work in healthcare, um, so it's a, it's it's slightly different. But either um, we see buildings responding by sort of sterilizing the removing all surfaces that someone mm -hmm. could interact with. And so it becomes sterile or um, they allow touch. And then there's sort of a person that kind of walks around, walks behind the visitors and cleans everything down. Neither is is appropriate. Neither is is a ideal situation. And I think that museums can really teach us a lot because um, in terms of the materials, the mechanical systems, the surveillance, the CO2 tracking, the light tracking, all the systems they have to protect the artifacts, we can use to think about how to create healthy environments for users to interact. So I think museums could actually become a precedent that could lead the way for other typologies to learn from um, toward this healthier future state. Mm -hmm. Do I have any minutes left? Uh, <laughs> did I use the type? <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I I think that operationally, museums uh, their approaches have to differ a lot. Obviously, the approach for a museum that has you know thirty thousand or more visitors a day is going to be different than a museum where the galleries are mostly open, and you might be one or two visitors at a time in those. I think of the Dia Beacon, for example, where you can roam those galleries and really not encounter many people at all. Um, and I think that your experience with art can be much more in depth and intimate when you can enjoy a space that's not overwhelmed with people. And I think that uh, why not have museums be uh, experienced in that way, as long as operationally uh, the staff necessary to support and stay open as a facility, uh, as long as the economics of that work, I think that um, appropriately masked uh, visitors should have no concerns visiting museums in that way. I mean, the Museum of the West does have its large uh, scale events. But um, you can visit the museum and, and as I say, like other other large scale museums, you can move around and encounter very few people and have a different experience with art. I think it's just a shift in one's perception of, of what um, one's experience. Obviously, the cafes and those kinds of spaces have a whole different um, reality to deal with. But the museum experience itself, I, I see no reason why museums can't find some way to maintain operations. And Dan, your your statistics are very encouraging. I can see that with the park component to your facility. I think you're, it's a truly inspiring environment. The access to nature and the interior uh, museum spaces, the contrast is, is stunning and offers tremendous variety for people. I must, I mean, you must be uh, very thankful that you have that kind of, uh, space to offer to your community. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yes, both thank you. And I have to say it's also been a challenge uh, because 
it requires uh, staff to maintain those. And so the staff had to, I mean, they were scared because um, immediately after the lockdown, people came, uh, it was kind of scary crowded on some days and they were nervous about doing their very jobs. Um, but then things began to settle down and hit a kind of equilibrium. And we were allowed to finally open our doors uh, just a few weeks ago, um, whether or not to be able to stay open is still a question, but so we're down to this kind of like lower level, like you were saying, we're down to like 2,500 people a week. For us, that's pretty low. Um, <clears throat> but as I walk through the galleries, I enjoy it so much. <laughs> because uh, it's not like it's empty. It's not like it's a big echo chamber, but it's kind of like it was when I was a kid yeah. and going yeah. to museums that were uh, before spectacle. And so mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. noticed personally, people spending more time with works of art, mm -hmm. um, certainly outside, but inside in our galleries. Um, mm -hmm. And during the summer when we were very briefly open, I turned out all of the lights, so it was only natural light and, and not so many people, and it was magical. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean to make light of the pandemic, but it does have this kind of otherworldly mm -hmm. uh, aesthetic side to right. it. It's, all, it's, it's not all bad. I think I say that about the whole work from home aspect too, right? It's not all bad. There are things we can learn uh, I think of the exhibits that open up in New York at the MoMA and it's just crazy in there. And that's a, you know, you go to the Louvre and you, you want to see the Mona Lisa you, or the Sistine Chapel. You, you know, I hear about the way they're operating the Sistine Chapel. And I think, well, this is an ideal time to go and finally mm -hmm. have an experience where you're not being shoved around the, the room to just stand and enjoy art. It's yeah. tough though, it is isn't it? Because that necessarily limits the accessibility of it. I mean, that then limits the people who can make it and have to make an appointment way in advance and et cetera. And it's like, I think that's a constant push and pull for many museums and many cultural institutions generally is how do you open it to everyone and, and truly make it not an elite institution, you know, an institution only for right. elite people, but how do we open it and make it for the larger community, for diverse communities? And yet still, in certain this time, keep right. it safe and keep the air healthy, etc. And I think we are going to have to close. So thank you all very much. It was an absolute pleasure to host you. And um, everyone I know, Megan had to leave early. It's Hanukkah, first night of Hanukkah, so she had to do family stuff. Um, but she did say, if anyone has any questions, you can reach out to her and um, I can provide your write an email address for her if you have any questions for her. So thank you all so much. Have um, safe evenings and good, good holidays. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.